So for those of you whose brains hate these huge, big picture, large questions, we're now going to get more detailed, more focused, more in depth. <laughs> and we're going to just look at a definition of specifically what is Bitcoin <laughs> um, and what is the proper way to understand what it is. So Craig, reassure those of us that need focus. Okay, at the moment. thank you very much. Okay, pretty neat. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm here, to uh, here today to talk to you about Bitcoin. Uh, I'm excited to, to do that. I uh, became pretty intensely interested in Bitcoin about a year and a half ago, and I haven't come up from the rabbit hole yet. Uh, but I asked myself a question then that many of you have already asked for yourselves, and that's a question about uh, how Bitcoin works. It's a very technical question, interdisciplinary question. Um, it's a question about how the components on the network work together to achieve Bitcoin's end or purpose. It's a question about uh, Bitcoin's mechanics, very functional question. But there's a, another question which I also um, am very interested in, especially as a philosopher. And this is a philosophical question. So what is Bitcoin? And, and I don't mean like the network, the system, I mean the actual uh, unit of money. What, what is a Bitcoin? So as I began reading papers from uh, a variety of disciplines, I saw that many different people had landed on a particular definition of a Bitcoin, uh, and they say that a Bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures, a chain of digital signatures. And I think it's fairly obvious how so many different people from so many different disciplines landed on this one definition, and that's because on the second page of the Bitcoin white paper, Satoshi defines um, electronic coins as chains of digital, digital signatures. So if you think that Satoshi is right um, about electronic coins, and if you think the, the electronic coins of the white paper uh, really are Bitcoins as we think of them today, then it's legitimate to infer that Bitcoins themselves are also chains of digital signatures. Um, but in my view, uh, no Bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures. And in fact, the electronic coins in the white paper aren't uh, what we think of as Bitcoins as we know them today. And I think many Bitcoin developers already know this. Um, they know that this uh, chain definition, as we'll call it, is false. Um, so one, one thing I want to do today is be kind of a uh, mule or donkey, maybe in more, more ways than one, uh, but to carry some information from those who are closer to the epicenter of Bitcoin development to those who are further away. And I think we should do that because this chain definition, even though it's false, keeps popping up in academic papers across a, a variety of dif a dis disciplines. Um, another reason I'm going to go through this is because even the people who know that the chain definition is false, um, they, they still think that um, uh, the uh, uh, definition that Satoshi provides is true when we understand electronic coins as, as what we call UTXOs. I think that's false also. So I'm going to go through um, those two things by asking these three questions in the brief time we have together. So number one, what does the chain definition mean? We'll go through that quickly. Two, why does it fail? And three, what did Satoshi likely mean um, instead? And uh, we'll, we'll try to interpret him charitably. So first question, uh, what does the chain definition mean? So what does it mean to say that a Bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures? And it's clear from the context of these papers across a variety of disciplines that propound or endorse the, the definition that uh, what is identified with a chain of digital signatures is uh, the thing that neatly divides into 100 million Satoshis. It's the thing with the predicted max supply of uh, 100, uh, or sorry, 21 million. Okay? And so we'll be using uh, Bitcoin in the count noun sense, like we talk about trees and tables and chairs, and not in the mass noun sense, like we talk about uh, liquid, um, uh, like water. Okay? Even though it grades on me to talk about Bitcoins, that's what we'll have to do. Uh, so what does it mean to say that a Bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures? Uh, and more fundamentally, what is a digital signature? Well, I think it's, it's best to understand digital signatures by analogy with physical signatures on checks. So uh, a, a signature on a check helps a custodian verify your ownership over some funds. And uh, when you write your signature on a check, it also authorizes the transfer of the ownership. I'm thinking of the signature on the front of the check, not on the back. Okay. All right. Now, in Bitcoin, a digital signature also does these two things. 
It verifies your ownership over some unspent quantity of Bitcoin, and it also authorizes the transfer of that ownership. Um, and we'll look at this at a, a sufficiently high level of abstraction. I know I'm missing a lot of details here, and some of the, a lot of the things that I'll say are technically incorrect, but this is good enough. So suppose you receive some Bitcoin at an address. That address is generated by a public key, which is itself generated by a private key. That's like a password. And in order to spend the Bitcoin that you receive at an address, you specify the public key that generates that address, along with uh, a few bits of information. The source of Bitcoin, uh, by reference to the transaction and, and the output number of the transaction that uh, gave you Bitcoin at, at your address, and then how much to spend where. So you specify how much to spend to each address that you want to send it. All right? And then when you compose a transaction like this, you take the information encoded in these blue rectangles, and you provide your private key, your password, and it all spits into the signature function, and that function spits out a digital signature. And that digital signature shows, uh, which we can use to verify whether or not you use the correct password uh, for the address at which you received this unspent Bitcoin. All right? So there we have some digital signatures. Um, and here we have a, a chain of digital signatures. So in this last transaction, and you know, block height 97, this is all made up, of course, um, D receives some Bitcoin. Uh, where did D get it from? Well. D receives the Bitcoin in a, in a transaction with C's signature, which specifies C's public key, and the source of that Bitcoin was transaction 237. So then we hop up to transaction 237 and ask, well, where did that come from? Well, C's address received that Bitcoin from uh, B. That transaction has B's digital signature, and the source of that Bitcoin was transaction 105, and so on. We can keep going. So here we have a chain of digital signatures. Um, that encodes this particular Bitcoin's transaction history. Okay. Um, this quotation from a European Central Bank uh, report on virtual currencies from 2012 embodies uh, much of the meaning of the, ch of the chain definition. It says that every single Bitcoin carries the entire history of the transactions it has undergone, and any transfer from one owner to another becomes part of the code. Okay. So we can paraphrase the chain definition as saying that uh, a Bitcoin is the chain of digital signatures that represents its entire tr transaction history. All right? And I think that fails. I'm going to show you why very quickly. Through uh, three stages of transactions, this first stage has two transactions where um, address A1 claims some Bitcoin um, spent to it and sends it along to address 3. And address 2 does the same thing and also sends another Bitcoin to address three. So now, um, address three can claim two Bitcoin and, and sit along somewhere else. But at this point, the, the two Bitcoins that are you know, at A3, they're distinguishable. And they're not distinguishable because they have different names. No uh, Bitcoins or Satoshis have names or traceable identifiers like social security numbers or anything like, like that in the blockchain. Uh, but they're distinguishable because every quantity of unspent Bitcoin is tied essentially to its most recent transaction, to its most recent transaction. And so we, when we zoom in here on these two transactions, we have the inputs in yellow and the outputs in blue. Okay, And one Bitcoin at A3 is tied to the transaction that it received from A1. And one Bitcoin at A3 is tied to the other transaction it received from address A2. Now suppose A3 claims both of those Bitcoin and sends it to address A4 in a single transaction. At this point, the two Bitcoins become indistinguishable from each other. They're completely fungible with each other. That's because they arrived in the, mo in the same transaction. So there's no way to specify, um, to the, the, uh, there's no ability to send one rather than the other in a future transaction. Okay, and so we can see here uh, in this uh, third transaction, uh, transaction ID 3, that we have two inputs. And then there both Bitcoins are funneled into a single output. So one output of two Bitcoin to A4. Now suppose A4 sends one Bitcoin to, thank you, uh, sends one Bitcoin to A5 in one transaction, and then spends another Bitcoin in another transaction to address a6, 
All right? And so what we have to do here is claim that previous output for a new input, and then we have two new outputs. All right? And then we can ask, did the Bitcoin at A5 or the Bitcoin at A6 come from address A1 rather than A2? Or did the Bitcoin at A6 come from A2 rather than A1? And then the answer is that there's actually no fact of the matter. And this isn't an epistemological problem. It's not as if the information is there and we just can't uncover it. Um, it's actually a metaphysical one. It's not even, or an ontological one. It's not even there to be known. Okay? All right? And so what this means is that if we trace the Bitcoin at A5 back through its uh, transaction history, history uh, gets smeared uh, or it goes dark. There's no fact of the matter about whether it came from address A1 or address A2. Okay? So what we've done here is we've just um, uh, mixed coins, uh, but we haven't done coin join. So coin join is, is what happens when you mix coins in a single transaction. You have multiple inputs, uh, multiple outputs. Um, here, uh, we've, we've mixed coins of a, a series of transactions by funneling multiple inputs into a single output, then in a future transaction, uh, uh, splaying out that output into to more outputs. Okay? And this is possible again because no Satoshi, no Bitcoin has a, a traceable identifier, you know, like a social security number or a, a, an ID or anything like that. Okay, so, so my diagnosis of the chain definition is that it, it falsely presupposes that Bitcoins are individuals with which we can identify with things like chains of digital signatures. And in fact, all we have are primitive quantities of Bitcoin. We don't have individuals of Bitcoin. Okay, all right. Um, and two, the chain definition is in pretty bad shape, not only because it falsely presupposes that uh, Bitcoins are individuals, uh, but also falsely presupposes that we can identify them with things like chains of digital signatures that encode their entire transaction histories. And uh, as we saw in the you know, series of transactions, there are no entire transaction histories of Bitcoin uh, because of the way that inputs and outputs funnel Bitcoin in and out. Um, and so uh, transaction histories are... Uh, uh, ontologically dependent of the things that they're transaction histories of. So if you don't have the individuals in the first place, you don't have transaction histories of those individuals, right? So the chain definition is in really bad shape, both sides of the equation here, right? And so then the question is, well, if the chain definition fails, what did Satoshi originally mean? And uh, he says, electronic, we define electronic coins as uh, chains of digital signatures, and I think it's helpful to make a distinction to figure out what Satoshi meant. So like checks, UTXOs are financial instruments. And like dollars, Bitcoins are units of signified quantities that the UTXOs represent. Okay? So at this point, you might have this idea, which I think is a bad proposal, which is to identify the electronic coins in the white paper with UTXOs. I do think some people think this. And this proposal does have a nice feature because it can explain um, how the chain definition goes wrong. That is, if the proposal were true. Um, how could we explain? Well, we could say that the chain definition goes wrong because it replaces the reference to the financial instrument, the electronic coins, with a reference to the, the signified units, the bitcoins. Okay? But this is, this is a, a bad proposal. Um, why is it a bad proposal? Well, uh, transaction outputs exist uh, uh, es essentially in the, the one transaction in which they appear. So th they, don't, um, they don't exist over a series of transactions, and an and, and unspent transaction output is destroyed when you spend it. Okay. Okay. And I think so we need a, another distinction. Unspent transaction output um, unspent transaction output is ambiguous between two things. Uh, the UTXO, like the chunk of code, and then the unspent quantity of Bitcoin that the chunk of code represents. Okay? And the, um, the, the unspent quantity that a UTXO represent, re represents is not the UTXO. 
Uh, I think this is a, a pretty easy point to make, just as the name Einstein is not the man Einstein, or the words MIT Bitcoin Expo are not the event of the MIT Bitcoin Expo, the chunk of code um, that represents an unspent quantity of Bitcoin is not itself the unspent quantity of, quantity of Bitcoin. Right? So my proposal then is to understand Satoshi is saying that um, uh, what an electronic coin is are these unspent quantities of Bitcoin. And furthermore, he's not identifying unspent quanti quantities of Bitcoin with chains of digital signatures. He's doing something that a lot of theoreticians do in a variety of disciplines, which is he's, he's, he's uh, using chains of dig uh, digital signatures to model something. So you might model you know, a point in space with uh, uh, the natural, uh, 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 an ordered intuple of natural numbers. Uh, philosophers model uh, propositions with sets of possible worlds and so on. And I think what Satoshi is doing here is he's modeling unspent quantities of Bitcoin with chains of digital signatures for as long as, they, as that quantity of Bitcoin persists through the blockchain. Okay, so some conclusions here. Uh, no Bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures. The electronic coins in the white paper are quantities of unspent Bitcoin and not UTXOs. Okay, so we can understand Satoshi is saying something like this. Let a chain of digital signatures represent an unspent quantity of Bitcoin, right? Now, there's an interesting aspect of understanding Satoshi in this way, and that's that he interestingly, interestingly departs from his predecessors in how he talks about the financial instruments. So if we think of David Chom or Hal Finney, um, for them, the financial instrument, either a token or a note, is actually, actually a string of symbols that signifies some, some quantity of value. And Satoshi here is identifying or representing the coins not with those things, but with the, uh, the signified quantities of value. Okay, now, um, uh, so these are like my ultimate conclusions. Uh, crypto economic systems will succeed only if practitioners cross uh, disciplinary boundaries. Uh, this is true for any uh, new field of interdisciplinary research. But with that, we uh, will encounter different kinds of risks. One risk is, is uh, something that's called epistemic trespassing, which is what I've been doing up here. Uh, that's when <laughs> someone from another field kind of, you know, walks into another field and tells people how to do things without the disciplinary tools. Um, and there's also gatekeeping. You know, when I, when I walk in and someone says, get off my lawn. Um, so that will also happen instead of engaging in collaborative spirit. Um, there's also the risk of mis miscommunicating, especially with superficially similar uh, uh, terminology. And, and finally, and this is, I think, um, uh, quite prevalent in the crypto community, um, people exploiting the confusion, the resulting confusion from all this uh, for a personal gain. Uh, now, I, I want to make a pitch then that philosophers can really help. Uh, I know this is a very self-serving thing, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I talk about exploiting for personal gain. So, um, uh, so philosophers can, I mean, philosophers are trained in evaluating arguments, clarifying concepts, um, and systematizing uh, some domain of knowledge. And so I think we, we can help in an, especially a new interdisciplinary field. But I also think, um, that philosophers are, are necessary for certain questions. There are very important questions uh, about Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies more generally that uh, we need the disciplinary tools of, philosoph of, of uh, philosophy for. So for example, um, I've only answered the question of, of what Bitcoin is not. <laughs> I haven't really said much about what Bitcoin is. And then once you have an answer about what Bitcoin is, um, you can start to work on other questions like, how do we tell whether in a hard fork this is the real Bitcoin or that's the real Bitcoin? And of course, this is a, a philosophical question. So thank you very much. And I'll be interested to hear of any thoughts. Great. So let's take just a few questions. I know we're running a little bit late, but Wasim, are you jumping in? 
Hi, Craig. So um, I'm an epistemic trespasser, but I think I'm one of the good ones. So like, uh, please don't be angry with me. So I had a s small point of clarification when you said that those two UTXOs were uh, functionally identical and they couldn't be differentiated when they were spent. There's a thing called uh, a UTXO control or coin selection in some advanced wallets, which could distinguish one UTXO from another. It does depend on the implementation that is being used. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to be selfish as well. And I have some a definition of Bitcoin coming from like a network level. I kind of think yeah. of Bitcoin like a time machine. And so I define Bitcoin in terms of um, how much thermodynamic security you can buy with a Bitcoin. So every 10 minutes or nine and a half minutes, there's a block. Yeah. Every block contains a reward of 12 and a half Bitcoins. Yeah. Therefore, a one Bitcoin can be implicitly understood as the value of 75 seconds of computational resource def directed at defending the network from thermodynamic attacks and maintaining the assurance of the canonical ledger. So yeah. maybe there's another interesting uh, tidbit there. Like I, I've gone as far as I can as a trespasser, so please continue. Yeah. Thank you, Wasim. So the, the, the point about UTXOs, which two were you thinking of? Um, it, wasn't, no, it, wasn't, it wasn't that diagram. Oh. There was a, a black and white diagram. Uh, I think it was this one, yeah. OK. Um, so you could differentiate between A5 and A6 in, in, in a wallet that has advanced coin selection features. Oh, no, I agree. So, so, so we'll have different UTXOs there. So, so we have the two here. They will be distinguished. They'll have different output numbers. Um, but the, 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 the Bitcoin that they signify, um, we won't be able to pinpoint one and say that one came from address A1 rather than A2. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah. And then the, the, the second very interesting definition of Bitcoin that you provide. Do you mean it as like a a fundamental definition of what a Bitcoin is. I'm a definitions minimalist, so I was just trying yeah. to find the simplest goddamn definition I could yeah, find because yeah, yeah. I'm not that smart. So yeah. that was just the simplest I could get it. Yeah, very good. So um, there, are, there are ways to uh, provide accounts of things. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a Ramsey definition. Okay, so a Ramsey definition is a, is a way to uh, replace, re replace um, the interesting labels in a theory with variables, and then you get a kind of uh, functional definition of what, a th of what a thing does or how it works in the system. And I think what you've provided is something like that, and I think it's very interesting. Wonderful. Any questions from people who haven't spoken? Great. <laughs> That's not you, Wasim. Hello. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thanks. I, I appreciate the, the philosophy perspective. Um, just quick thought. I, uh, I wonder if uh, the fact of the matter about what a Bitcoin is, if the answer is, is from um, what Satoshi wrote or what he meant, or if it's possible that he didn't truly understand the nature of his invention and yeah. there's some facts of matter about uh, what a Bitcoin is. But what I really wanted to ask was uh, just uh, thinking off the cuff, like if you broke it down to say individual Satoshis, um, Maybe there is a fact of the matter about the identity of one. If you start with the block reward and then assume like a FIFO ordering every time some amount of sats leaves the UTXO, and maybe when you combine the two, when A3 sends A4, those are ordered in the transaction in one way or the other, and then that constitutes the FIFO ordering of those sats. Maybe there is a fact of the matter about how to individuate one sat across time. I don't know. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, that's very interesting, um, and, and this will bring out some of my uh, trespassing behavior. Uh, but so on, on the second point, first, I'm not sure what then whether the w w when we're talking about individual satoshis, whether um, the way that they get their their outputs get ordered uh, would matter for their identity. But I'm thinking that um, within within a transaction, uh, it doesn't. So here's where I was thinking then. Within a transaction, it, outputs don't claim particular inputs. Um, and uh, so even if there was a particular way that outputs got ordered within transactions, there would still be no fact of the matter about where a particular Satoshi goes and which output, because there's no, there's no tie. Um, you just have the, the input amount, imp or input amounts, and then you have the output amounts. And it's not like uh, the tie that we get from 
transaction inputs to previous transaction outputs. There, we are specifying the sources of Bitcoin, but not within, but not within transactions, it seems to me. Um, the first point is very interesting. So uh, I think it's quite possible Satoshi didn't under quite understand exactly what he was doing. Uh, but if we charitably interpret him, I think this is closer to what he must have meant. Of course, we don't have to charitably interpret him. Uh, uh, or, or or their gender either, you know, or yeah, their yeah, yeah, singularity. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Speaking of what are things. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, any more uh, last burning questions? Yeah, just quickly, I was going to make a comment. Um, you know, taint analysis takes multiple hypotheses on to solve this. I think there is no fact of the matter, strictly speaking. Yeah. But for all sorts of practical applications, you do have to uh, make a fact. <laughs> Uh, okay. So you just sort of construct one. Yeah. So the popular taint analysis strategy is to just mix them evenly and then to maintain a pro rata distribution. Yeah. Um, because that sort of represents the, in, um, from a legal perspective, it's probably, I'm not a lawyer, but that's yeah. probably the safest thing to do from a legal perspective. So yeah. that's why people do it that way. Yeah. So there's going to be a probabilistic judgment about um, who had which Bitcoin. Y yeah. It's like yeah. a pro rata distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even if, but if the probability is quite high, the blockchain doesn't itself specify. Exactly, yeah. right. It's not encoded yeah. in the chain itself. Yeah, thank yeah. you.